Let me ask you this question. Can you trust your heart? <laughs> Jeremiah 17 says the heart is desperately wicked above all. It's sick. Now, we would like to agree with the modern culture of today. In fact, you've probably heard it many times. Follow your heart. Just do whatever your heart says to do. I'll tell you an experience in my life. Uh, today, I start seven years with this church. And I was thinking back to my last church. And about that same time, uh, when I was in that spot, back in that church... To be honest, I didn't want to stay. My heart was that I wanted to move on. You see, the church had plateaued where there wasn't really a lot of new growth. And with that, as you could imagine, the morale of the church kind of became less than pleasant. And people were complaining. Offerings were going down. Now, I had made a commitment to them to be there for 10 years, but I was rationalizing that and saying, well, they would just be better with someone else. But that was my heart. But God made it clear to me. You had made a covenant. You made a commitment. You need to honor it. So I made the decision I would stay there for the remaining three years. That next year, we experienced a lot of growth. Over 20 people baptized. God was faithful. But I didn't follow my heart. Now, ultimately, if I had, I would probably not experience the growth that took place. And I most certainly wouldn't be here, which has been one of the greatest joys of my life. So can you follow your heart? Better said, should you follow your heart? We're in the midst of a series uh, that we are defining God's purpose, unique purpose for each of our lives. And that there are five characteristics that you can use to determine your purpose. The first of which, we start off spiritual gifts. Each of these form an acronym shape. Next is heart, which we'll talk about today. The, the passions, the desires that you have in your heart can help you understand what God has called you to do. And you say, well, wait a sec. You just said I can't trust my heart. That's true. But some of the things that are in your heart are good. In fact, the Bible says, delight yourself in the Lord and he will give you the desires of your heart. Meaning that there are times when your heart wants the right thing. So how do I know the difference? It's a great question. That's what we're going to talk about today. Not only that, we're going to see from God's word what caused the problem in our heart to begin with. But that we might better understand our own heart. When I say heart, you obviously already know. I'm not talking about the literal heart that beats in your chest, but I'm talking about this figurative heart that is the seat of your emotion, the, the seat of your thinking and your will. That heart, the Bible tells us, is desperately wicked. Take a look at Mark chapter 7. That's where we're going to be starting this morning. But in the gospel of Mark, Jesus makes it very clear that the heart cannot be trusted on its own. In Mark chapter 7, he talks about what comes out of the heart. And that's what I want to look at with this morning. As you're able, would you stand with me, please, as a demonstration of respect for God's holy written and errant word. And the Bible says, verse 20, And he said, What comes out of a person is what defiles him. From within, out of the heart of man, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, Theft, murder, adultery, coveting, wickedness, deceit, sensuality, 
These evil things come from within, and they devile, defile a person. Let's pray. Father, we do seek to understand the unique purpose that you have for each of us. That, Father, we would be intimately acquainted with what you've called us to do. And through this, Father, we've looked at spiritual gifts, and today we look at the desires and the passions of our heart. But we must first recognize that on our own, we cannot trust our heart. So now, Father, I ask you to help us understand why that is. And through it, that we might come to you with a right heart. This we pray in Christ's name. And God's people said, thank you. You may be seated. I think Jesus makes it pretty clear. Some of the stuff that comes out of your heart, not good. Don't trust it. But at the same time, there are points in Scripture where it says that you should trust your heart. Paul writing, in second, uh, Paul writing to Timothy and saying, if you desire the office of an overseer, you desire a good thing. In other words, that that desire is good. Why is it that our heart cannot be trusted? Well, I'm going to get to that in just a sec, but this is the main idea I want you to get. Get this one thing, you pay for your gas this morning. Ultimately, I can't rely on my heart unless it is right with God. I cannot rely on my heart, my desires, my passions. I can't trust them unless I make sure that my heart is right before God. With that, a question, is your heart right? The Bible tells us that our heart has been corrupted by sin. That's point number one in your notes. My heart has been corrupted because of sin. When Adam and Eve were first created, God looked at them and said, Good! Then what happened? Sin came in. And sin completely and totally corrupted them. When I was an undergraduate, we took a tour of a wastewater treatment facility. And as it was, you started at the beginning of this facility and raw sewage came in. Then there was biological filtration, mechanical filtration, and it came to the very end of this place uh, where the, the tour guide, one of the engineers, said, and now the water is safe to even drink. And he, he, he put some water in a cup. Of course, my hand went up. I said, drink it. He said, no, nah, I don't think I'm going to do that. But trust me, it's safe to drink. If it was sewage... Even if you pretty it up a little bit, guess what? We still think of it as sewage. To put it another way, how many drops of something bad would go into a glass of water before you wouldn't drink it? So it is with sin. Sin completely and totally corrupted Adam and Eve. And here's the bad news. It's a genetic condition. It passed from Adam and Eve to every person. That our very nature, our very heart, is corrupted by sin. I wrote this down under point number one in your notes. The fall brought lasting consequences. The fall of mankind spread Not just to Adam and Eve, but to all of us. To where the very desires that we have, we cannot trust. I wrote this reference down in your note, Romans chapter 5. And it says, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man, and death through sin, so death spread to all men, because... All have sinned. We are all corrupted. 
by sin. That our heart has become a heart of stone. There are those people that would say, mankind, human beings are naturally good by themselves and it's only the environment that causes us to do the wrong thing. There are people that would think that until they have children. I don't know about your kids. Your kids are probably perfect, right? I didn't have to teach my kid to lie. None of them. I had to teach them to tell the truth. I didn't have to teach my kids to be selfish. They came up with that all on their own. I had to teach them how to share. That you can see from a child that there is not a pure slate on their heart, but their heart is changed because of sin. And there is absolutely nothing we can do on our own to remove that. We, we can't pretty it up. We can't just do enough good works to, to, to resuscitate our heart. The Bible says it's dead. And the only cure is getting a new heart. And that's something that we do through Jesus Christ. See, the problem is sin. Jesus came, and he became sin for us and died for it. So that when we come to Christ, when we say, I am a sinner and I need what you have done for me in my life. And when we make that decision by faith, what happens? Our heart is changed. The old heart, the heart of stone is taken out and a new heart is placed in there. I wrote this down for point number two in your notes. My heart is changed at my salvation. Glory to be to God that when we receive Christ... There's a transformation that takes place. If you are a child of God, you have been made new. 2 Corinthians says it this way. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, they are a new creation. The old has passed away, and behold, the new has come. Turn to somebody near you and say, hey, I'm new. Are you new this morning? Are you new in Christ? Have you received Jesus Christ? Because if not, you are not new. Now that means that we can ultimately trust our heart, right? Because we've come to Christ. We've been made new. We can, we can always trust our heart then. Nope. Why? We have been completely changed, but our change is not yet complete. We are not yet perfect. The Bible calls it our flesh. The leftover from our old nature is still part of us in this life. And because of the flesh that we have, there will still be desires, there will still be passions that are not good. I wrote it down this way under point number two. My flesh will always be a challenge. That is in this life. My flesh will always be a challenge. And therefore, you cannot just by default trust what your heart wants. You can't do it. There was a pastor that was fairly new to a congregation. He told his people, he said, next week I'm going to be preaching on lying. And I'm giving you a little bit of homework. What you need to do is you need to go home and you need to read Mark chapter 17 before we get back to church next week. And so the next week came, and he said, all right, how many of you did your homework? How many of you read Mark chapter 17? Several hands went up, and then uh, a little later, all, uh, more hands, and then pretty soon, just about every hand was up. And he says, now I'm here to talk to you about lying, folks. There's only 16 chapters in the Gospel of Mark. All oh, snap. And that's how it was. He said, uh, we're going to talk a little bit about lying because in our flesh, we still have desires that are not good. And we will always be challenged by our flesh. So what's the difference between being saved and not being saved? There was a young girl, she was about eight or nine years old, came forward one Sunday for baptism. 
and she wanted to publicly profess her faith through being immersed in baptism. It's a great thing to do. The pastor looked at her and said, do you know Jesus? He said, yes, I, I've, I've received Jesus as my Lord and Savior. He said, how is your life different because of that? She thought for a moment. She said, before I knew Jesus, it seemed like I was always running towards sin, doing whatever I could to get there without being caught. But now after Christ, it seems like I'm always just running away from sin. There are times where I still make mistakes, but I'm constantly yearning to be right. And there is the difference. Without Christ, we are slaves to sin. We are depraved. Not that a person who does not know Christ is always going to do the worst things. But if a person does not yet know Christ, they are slaves to their sin. There is nothing that they can do on their own to rid themselves of the shackles of sin. But Jesus, because of his great love for us, gave us an opportunity by paying for our sin. And we just have to come to him and say, I want what you did for me. And then our heart is new. But yet, we still can't trust it. There will be times where what we want, we shouldn't have. So then what do we do? How do we get to the point where we can say, I know this passion, this heart, this desire is good. Well, I wrote this down for point number three in your notes. My heart must be calibrated by Scripture. My heart must be calibrated by Scripture. What does it mean to calibrate something? Yeah, to, to make sure it's accurate. The Bible says in Hebrews chapter 4, specifically, for the word of God is living and active, sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing to the division of soul and spirit, joints and marrow, and is discerning of the thoughts and intentions of heart. That when I look to the perfect word of God, it is alive and it is active, and it shows me what's right and it shows me what's wrong based upon even my thoughts and my motives. You know, there's times where I'll preach a specific message and someone will come up to me afterwards and say, you been talking to my wife? <laughs> no. So I'm, I'm pretty sure you've been talking to my wife because she had to tell you. I said, no. Uh, honestly, no. The Word of God is living and active. And so it might feel like it is directly pointing at you. And guess what? That's because it is. Because as the Holy Spirit lives in you, he makes the word alive, he makes the word active. And it's a means by which you must calibrate your own heart. Most of you know I, I volunteer as a, a chaplain for the Anancock Police Department. I get the great privilege of riding around with some of the best officers in the country. And it's a privilege that I have. One of the things that they must do as they are enforcing speed, and I know probably nobody here likes getting a speeding ticket, None of you have even gotten a spinning ticket, apparently. But one of the things they do in order to make sure that they are accurately measuring speed, their radar unit sends out sound waves. In order to make sure those sound waves are being received correctly, that radar must be calibrated every time. They have just this little tuning fork. They smack the tuning fork and they hold it up to it, and it makes sure that it is running true. We have to do that every time. So our heart must be calibrated to the objective truth of the word of God. We cannot just trust it. Sometimes we might be tempted to think that our conscience, that is our heart, will always tell us right or wrong. And I've heard people say, well, this must be right because it's something that I really want. Or it must not be wrong because if it was wrong, I, I, I wouldn't want it. I told you the experience I had. We cannot trust our heart. Conscience is not inerrant. 
Our conscience just motivates us to do what is right, and we know what is right by the Word of God. And we must stay focused on the Word of God each and every day to make sure that our lives are in tune with what it says. I wrote it down this way under point number three. My focus must remain consistent. It's not enough to just pull out the Bible once a month. It's not enough to just calibrate your heart on occasion. One of the things we encourage you to do in this church is each and every day to spend the first 10 minutes of your day reading Scripture and praying. And it is that action that allows you to calibrate your heart each and every day. I'll tell you the experience I had. It was at my last church, and I'd only been there about two or three years. Uh, One morning, the Sunday school superintendent came up to me and said he needed to talk with me after uh, the service was over, and I said, sure. I sat down with him, and he said, Pastor, I want to be honest with you. I've been talking uh, in detail with a woman that's not my wife. In fact, she was my high school sweetheart. I just found out that she had got a divorce, and so she's kind of back on the market. And I want to move in with her and divorce my wife. And it must be of God, right? I said, let me get this straight. You have a desire to go against the covenant you made before God saying that you will love this woman till the day you die. And you, you believe God might be leading you to break that covenant just to, to go back to what you believe would be a high school sweetheart. I said, that's not from God. Because we know what the scripture teaches. We know that the Bible does talk about justification for divorce, but there are not very many. And it's certainly not that your high school sweetheart comes back on the market. And so he heard what I said, and he left the church, he left his wife, and he moved in with his high school sweetheart, leaving two children behind. I didn't see the man again for a few years, but I did just happen to run into him, and I'll be honest, he didn't look good, he didn't look happy, and upon talking with him, he was very clear, he wasn't, he wasn't happy like he thought he might be. Because although we might think we know what is best in our heart, don't trust it. You can only rely on your heart when your heart is right with God. That's the main idea I want you to walk away with. By way of review, if you're taking notes, the main idea I want you to get, I cannot rely on my heart unless my heart is right with God. Why is that? Because my heart was corrupted by sin. Point number one in your notes. My heart was corrupted by sin. Sin has made a lasting and permanent mark on our hearts. That began at the fall. Under point number one. The fall brought lasting consequences. The only solution then is to receive Jesus Christ. And then upon that act of salvation, my heart is changed. Point number two. My heart is changed at my salvation. It is a heart transplant. The heart of stone taken out, new heart put in, and you are now a child of God. Praise Jesus. That is a great thing. And if you do not yet know Jesus, today would be an awesome day for you to say, you know what, I'm a sinner, but I, I believe what Jesus did is important and it's important for me. But even still, you can't yet trust your heart. Because the flesh will always be a challenge. That's under point number two. The flesh will always be a challenge. But don't fear. There is a way by which you can make sure your heart is right with God. And that's point number three in your notes. My heart is calibrated by Scripture. 
I know my heart is right, not by the subjective feeling it has. It's not by the abundance of peace I might have. You know, I don't know what my decisions are right unless I look to the Word of God. The Word of God is the one thing that shows me objective, right versus wrong. It's the one thing that helps me know exactly what I want, I should want. And it is the Word of God that helps make sure my heart is right. But that focus, that focus on the word must be consistent. Under point number three, my focus must be consistent. And so as I wrap this up, I hope that you can take away from it. You can't trust your heart unless your heart is right with God. So here is the question. Is your heart right with God? Let me just challenge you to do two things. First, I want to challenge you to invite God to search your heart. This is your first concluding point. I should ask God to search me. Do you want to know if your heart's right? How about coming before God and go, God, search me. Try my heart. Try my thoughts. See if there be any wicked way in me. That's Psalm 139. Search me, O God, and know my heart. Try me and, and know and know my thoughts. And see if there are any grievous or sinful way in me. That's my challenge. Point. Come before God first and say, God, search me. And he answers that prayer pretty quick. And if there is anything in your heart that's not right, he'll show you. And that's so we can do this. And I challenge you, secondly, to do this. You can ask God to sanctify me. To set me apart from sin. To forgive me. To cleanse me. As David said, create a clean heart in me, O God. Renew a steadfast, a right spirit in me. So my second challenge is to you, after you ask God to search you, if, if there's anything in your heart that is not right, that you would come before God and say, God, I confess I'm a sinner. And I want you to forgive me of my sins. Because God is faithful and just that when we confess our sins, he will forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Praise be the name. And that's my challenge to you. And would you pray with me? Father, we thank you that although we have destroyed our own hearts, that through the willful sin and disobedience, that our heart has been turned to stone. But Lord, we thank you that you loved us enough to send Jesus so that we might by faith receive him and that you might give us a new heart. Father, I thank you for the new heart. But Lord, we know that we still have a flesh. And we must thereby calibrate our heart to make sure our heart is always right by the Word of God. So we thank you for your Word that helps us to know objectively what is true. But now, Father, we invite you to search us. We invite you to know our heart, to know our mind. And if there is anything in our lives that is not right, that you would show it to us, that we might confess it and find sanctification in you. Father, this is our prayer in Christ's name.